Hello everyone and welcome to an explanation of how to use the rocket propulsion analysis program that I featured in my previous rocket science video, the one that I designed a pressure-fed lander stage. The rocket propulsion analysis program can be found at propulsion-analysis.com and uh, basically the front page looks like this and uh, you can get a free trial version clicking here. The standard version is a demo but there is also this standard edition and the one I use is just this light edition. I don't know the difference between all these versions actually and I don't know what you get by registering for a license at all but this is a free version down here and it's quite sufficient for any uh, normal amateur purposes uh, since we're not getting paid for designing en rocket engines. If you're getting paid to design rocket engines you probably have better tools for this. Uh, so yeah, and you can see this for Windows, for Mac, and for Linux. And then you've got a pro program like this. And the first thing you do is choose your chamber pressure. You can choose between PSI, uh, megapascals, atmospheres. Uh, and basically, the higher the chamber pressure, the smaller the engine is physically to get the same amount of thrust. And that's good, but of course, the higher the chamber pressure, the stronger your chamber has to be to contain that pressure. So you're going to have to think about the materials and the thickness of the walls. And so it makes the uh, per area uh, weight of the chamber heavier, but then the entire engine becomes lighter because it's smaller. Uh, though it does increase in complexity because on the lower end, let's say uh, I'll, I'll go with PSI first. From 150 PSI, well, 100 PSI, even less than that. RCS thrusters operate at 20 to 50 PSI, uh, which is like two atmospheres to four atmospheres kind of area. And um, 150 PSI is more like the lunar uh, module descent engine. And it, all of these are pressure-fed engines, and that goes up to about 300 PSI. Pressure-fed engines are the simplest kind of engines. So 300 PSI is basically the limit for that. And uh, because, again, they get pretty big uh, because uh, just to get a small amount of thrust, you have to have a very big engine. And uh, so 300 PSI, which is two megapascals or about 20 atmospheres is what you're talking about there. Past that, you have to have some sort of uh, turbo pump gas generator thing, and that adds complexity to the system. And so that picks up from 300 PSI on to about 1500 PSI. Uh, so in atmospheres, that's uh, 20 to um, about 100. And in mag megapascals, that's two megapascals to 10 megapascals. Uh, beyond uh, 1,500 PSI, so basically the normal gas generator, expander cycles, that sort of thing. Um, I, I haven't seen too many that are beyond 1,500 PSI. And then after that, uh, you get the closed cycle engines. The stuff like the space shuttle main engine, the engines that the Soviets used uh, quite often. Uh, they were pretty good about the closed cycle thing. And so that's staged combustion engines. And then there's full flow stage combustion as well. All that goes up to 4,000 PSI. So 1,500 to 4,000, you're looking at uh, stage combustion engines and those are really complicated. Uh, for a while, uh, the, only one, the one, only one that was operating in America was the space shuttle main engine. And um, the Soviets like it though. So uh, they did a lot. Anyway, so you pick a chamber pressure, let's say 1,500, well, let's uh, knock it down just a little bit, 1,200 PSI. And that's uh, firmly in the gas generator area, though I, it's a high-end gas generator. Uh, like uh, the F1 engine was lower than that, so it was below 1,000 psi. So uh, even the RL10 the expander cycle engine uh, is below 1,000 psi. So uh, don't be afraid of having lower psi again. It just means that your engine's a little bit bigger than it otherwise would be. Um, but it's diminishing returns as you get really high up. The stage combustion engines they're smaller, but not that much smaller. Uh, again, per amount of thrust. Okay, so. Now your mixture ratio between the oxidizer and fuel. Now obviously you have to pick your fuels. They've got a lot built in and that's really what this program is about. 
So you click add and you pick which fuels you want to try. And obviously not, uh, and this, the, the, the top one is oxidizer actually, this oxidizer. And the most common oxidizers that you're going to be looking at, well, old, old timey sake, there's nitric acid. So that's um, uh, inhibited red fuming nitric acid right there. And uh, of course, oxygen. And so O2. And you can uh, filter it out by typing in this field if you uh, don't know like the symbol for it, you can search for it. And the main thing about this program is it has all the thermodynamic data built in, uh, which would otherwise be a pain to find and uh, deal with to calculate by hand. Um, I'm looking for nitrogen tetroxide. There. Uh, nitrogen tetroxide is uh, the one that usually mixes with uh, the hypergolic fuels uh, unless you're using nitric acid. So there's that. But you know, if you want to go for exotic stuff, there's all sorts of lithium business, there's potassium. Potassium's uh, used for a lot of smaller, like bottle rocket kind of things. And uh, fluorine, fluorine is really exotic. Well, let's try fluorine. So we've got a fluorine oxidizer. And uh, the usual thing that goes with that is hydrogen that uh, gets pretty energetic. But let's let's be a little bit more interesting. Let's have uh, hydrogen and we'll, we'll say that this is uh, should have a mass fraction of let's say 50% hydrogen. And then we'll have 50% kerosene RP1. And let's type in RP1. Okay, so that's kerosene. That's the normal kerosene that's used in everything including the Falcon rockets and all. So it's half RP1 half um, half hydrogen. That's the mass fraction. But why don't we have it set the mixture ratio to optimum? Okay, optimal efficiency. Now you could type in one, but probably if you're new to using this program, you don't know uh, what to use. Uh, you get to choose bipropellant and mopropellant, but keep in mind it expects things to combust. So if you pick mopropellant, it's not going to be a cold gas thruster, I don't think. I don't think it can do that. I'm not sure. Okay, so we've picked our fuel and oxidizer, and it's got to figure out the optimal um, mixture. Now we have to figure out our nozzle. Now, uh, you can pick either to optimize it for a certain pressure or a certain expansion area ratio. The area ratio is the ratio between the throat area and the end of the nozzle. And the throat area is determined by how much thrust you're going to be trying to pass through. And so the end of the nozzle is going to be some uh, multiple greater than that. And of course, if you don't have a whole lot of space, you know, like you're putting a lot of engines next to each other, or, uh, you know, you've got a certain size to your stage, like it's a 1.6 meter stage, you can't make the nozzle really big because it won't fit in the uh, fairing if it's an upper stage, for instance, or it won't be covered by the aerodynamics of the stage. So. Uh, you'll have to think about that once you finally get the number for how big the engine is. Uh, but you can just type something in. If it's a surface uh, engine, uh, 15, uh, maybe the, I mean, there are some that go down to 12 or even less, but 15 is pretty average for a surface uh, engine and maybe going up to 40, except for something like the uh, space shuttle main engine, which ultimately, you know, uh, went all the way up to orbit. So that had a higher expansion area ratio. These ratios go all the way up to beyond 200. The extendable nozzle of the RL-10B2, which is on the Delta IV rocket, that has like 280. So that's why it has an extendable nozzle because otherwise it's just too big. So, so they extend the nozzle out when it's igniting. Uh, but yeah, 280 is pretty, pretty long. Uh, for a normal vacuum nozzle, 80 to 100 is fine. And um, yeah, 80 will, basically the pressure that is optimized at um, nozzle ratio of 80 is about the same pressure as Mars surface, which is a hundredth of an atmosphere, something around there. Okay, so that's the expansion area ratio. That's all you need to set here. You can set other things, the, these are optional. And then uh, nozzle shape and efficiencies. There isn't really a perfect efficiency 
uh, on any engine. It will show you the uh, what you would have gotten if you had 100% efficiency. But let's have it just estimate the efficiency rather than typing it in. If you want to type it in, that's fine. Uh, they usually range from 90 to uh, 80. Uh, sorry, 90 to 98. And uh, this is the reaction efficiency in the combustion chamber, and this is the nozzle shape efficiency. Uh, so the nozzle shape efficiency, again, 90 to 98 would be a reasonable number. And it depends on, well, uh, that, that's something that ultimately you will only really know when you actually try and light an engine during a test, what, what kind of efficiency you actually got out of all your work. So yeah, um, that you just have to let it guess. Um, throttle settings, if you want to see how stuff changes if you throttle the engine. Let's have an engine that can throttle to 20%. So you can do that. Um, ah, don't worry about that. Okay, so we, we've set that. We don't need to click apply. So we've got this and have it calculate. So press that little play button and it'll do the calculations for you. So let's explain the calculations. First of all, we see oxidizer to fuel ratio, but we have two fuels. We predetermined that it's gonna be 50-50. So, so once you break out the fuel, uh, you have to split that in half. And you can see we've got a way, uh, a huge amount of oxidizer by mass compared to the amount of fuel. It's 7.5 is the ratio. So that's interesting. Here we have the pressures. This is the pressure at the injector, which is what you set here. So uh, we see eight megapascals. That's interesting. I thought it would be more like 10, but okay, whatever it says. Um, and then the nozzle exits uh, 0.0653, uh, which is, you know, basically for a sea level engine, that makes sense. Uh, that's uh, just, just a little bit, that's like four kilometers up or something. Um, temperature, that's really hot. <laughs> 4,473 Kelvin in the combustion chamber. And that's because we're using these exotic fuels. Well, I mean, hydrogen and oxygen always combust really hot. And I guess hydrogen and fluorine are the same way. And at the exit, it's still 2,370 Kelvin. Um, enthalpy is uh, just uh, how the energy changes, the intrinsic energy of stuff. Entropy, uh, you should take a thermodynamics course if you want to understand that. Um, specific heat, specific heat, gas constant, um, molecular weight. Um, if you saw my previous uh, video on how to design the pressure-fed lander stage, uh, you'll see where that comes in. And that's, uh, the smaller that is, the more efficient the engine is going to be. And we see 16 molecular weight, which is pretty darn good as far as stuff coming out the tailpipe. And the isentropic exponent in the previous video, this was the gamma. And that pops up in like all the equations all over the place. So yeah, that's fine. <laughs> and then uh, density, sonic velocity. Uh, this is the velocity to speed of sound because this is an error, right? The density is higher in all of this. And so the velocity to speed of sound is also higher. And that's important for the propagation of waves and combustion instability, right? I mean, uh, basically all the instability that could occur in the engine is due to waves bouncing through the combustion products. And those waves are going to be moving at the speed of sound. So we need to know that to calculate. Uh, so we use the number for the speed of sound and then we take the length of the chamber to see what the wavelength of uh, those waves propagating is going to be and uh, to calculate the resonance. For, eh, I, I don't know enough about that stuff, uh, acoustic instabilities, uh, to give you any sort of information on it. But basically that's why that's important. Uh, well, that's one reason why it's important. Also it's important, uh, though this already does it for you sort of, um, the velocity at the throat of the nozzle where it pinches together, it's uh, the tightest portion. Uh, the Combustion products have to be going at the speed of sound there. Basically, the shape of the engine, it contracts into the throat and then expands out with the nozzle. And the contraction bit uh, is when it's going subsonic up to Mach 1. Because if you uh, reduce the volume on this flow, it'll speed it up up to Mach 1. But past Mach 1, 
you have to expand out the flow, increase the volume to speed it up. Okay, velocity is the uh, exhaust velocity. And so, well, uh, there's the velocity at the throat, which is Mach 1. We can see that the velocity at the throat matches the sonic velocity, as we expected. Uh, the velocity in the chamber is basically zero. And, you know, it's sort of sitting there and waiting to explode. Uh, but um, velocity at the end of the nozzle is 4,000 meters per second, which means that our ISP is about 400. Now, that doesn't seem particularly good for uh, what you call a hydrogen oxygen engine or a hydrogen fluorine engine. But we've got this additional RP1. What's the good of having RP1? Well, it actually gives more thrust to the engine. A hydrogen oxygen engines or hydrogen fluorine engines don't tend to produce a whole lot of thrust. The throwing in some extra kerosene, I'm hoping, will give us a lot more thrust. Now, how do you figure if you get a lot of thrust out of an engine given a certain size? Well, that's this mass flux. And here it tells you kilograms per meter squared seconds. So uh, let's uh, take out the meter squared. So uh, this is the mass flow kilograms per second per meter squared. And so if you've got a nozzle that's exactly one meter squared, the amount of stuff that's going out of it is 233.99 kilograms per second. And of course, the amount that's going out of it and the speed determines how much, how much thrust you have. So if you take this mass flux, assuming one meter squared nozzle area, and multiply by this velocity, you're going to get your thrust. And let's just check out our units. So we, we are assuming one meter squared so that those units are out. And so it just becomes kilograms per seconds. And then multiply by meters per second. That gets you kilograms times meters per second squared. Meters per second squared is an acceleration. Kilograms is mass. Mass times acceleration is force or thrust. So uh, we're, we're going to get that. And if we work it out, uh, we get... Um, well, let me uh, use the calculator. 233.99 times 4003 gets us 936,661. That's 936 kilonewtons, or 936,661 newtons. And, well, that's uh, 936 um, kilonewtons is about the thrust of uh, upgraded Merlin 1D engine. And Merlin 1D engines tend to be about a uh, meter in diameter. Let me, let me actually check. Let's say it's uh, one meter squared. Sorry, I'm doing all this now. Uh, divide by pi, square root. Uh, so the radius is 0.56 meters and the diameter is there, therefore 1.12 meters. So yeah, it's a fairly tight area to get that amount of thrust out and fairly efficient. And that's thanks to the addition of the kerosene, though that does reduce the ISP. Okay, uh, down here it shows you what's actually coming out the end. And uh, if you're worried about toxic stuff, you might want to take a look at that, especially with this mixture, because you're going to get a lot, a lot of hydrofluoric acid. Nozzle, nozzle exit mass fraction, 92.88%. And uh, exit mole fraction, so uh, hopefully you've taken chemistry and you know what a mole is. So this is the fraction of the moles, uh, 76%. And uh, yeah, that's mostly what's coming out. What's mostly coming out is hydrofluoric acid, so... Mm, you might want to think about that. Uh, performance. Okay, uh, if you had 100% efficiency, you'd get 436.7 seconds in vacuum, but you don't. It decided that this could operate at 97% nozzle efficiency and 99% reaction efficiency. That's really good. Like I said, I would normally expect less than 98. And so overall efficiency is 96 and vacuum thrust 420.9. Uh, sorry, uh, vacuum ISP. Uh, sea level ISP is 376.8, and that's good for a sea level engine, of course. And if we wanted to have a vacuum engine, let's type in 80 here, a modest vacuum engine. Uh, we can see that the vacuum thrust is now much, 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 much better. 
uh, so I keep saying thrust. ISP is much, 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 much better, uh, 456. But the sea level ISP is 223. And we get this little thing saying that there's going to be flow separation, which means basically there's going to be turbulence in the nozzle. And turbulence in the nozzle can propagate up into the flow and cause combustion instability and stuff like that. Also, it can damage the nozzle. So that's that's a problem. You don't want to operate this engine. If you see flow separation, you're either going to have to design the nozzle to handle it, or you're going to not want to use this engine at sea level. Uh, of course, we put a vacuum nozzle. Let's see exactly where we're not going to get flow separation. And this is still flow separation at 40. Even 38 is fine, but 40 wasn't. So 38, basically the limit, 332, 443. And so that'll be your like shuttle, uh, space shuttle equivalent engine using these fuels. Um, not quite as good as the hydrogen oxygen, but uh, probably you're going to get uh, better thrust out of a certain area. So that's nice. And if we take a look, uh, this has gone down, the mass flux at the end of the nozzle. Remember, it used to be 233, now it's only 92 because we've got a bigger nozzle. And um, so less of the thrust is going through a certain area at a certain time. But how much thrust do we get per meter squared now? Now, roughly 398, 399 kilonewtons per meter squared of nozzle area. So that's what you get. This uh, other information is uh, thermodynamic database. So if you want to see the properties of uh, something, like it's uh, this is propylene, and I don't know enough about thermodynamics to tell you anything about all this business. Um, if you wanted to see an analysis of it at different chamber pressures, so you know you don't you don't really know which chamber pressure to use. So you've typed in something temporary, and you would like it to plot out the variations based on different chamber pressures. You can uh, oop, start. Ah, there we go. Um, it is now working on that. Okay, so now it's calculated all out for different chamber pressures. One thing you'll notice is the oxidizer fuel ratio changes. The optimal ratio changes based on the pressure. And uh, this is the, we had already set the nozzle exit area. If you want to see how that might uh, vary the results, you can try that out. Uh, but here we see that the higher the oxidizer ratio, the higher the temperature seems to get. Of course, the pressure also increases the temperature. PV equals nRT. The higher the pressure you get, the higher the temperature. And um, the, this is the ISP in vacuum. And so you can see it goes up, but not by much. Uh, if you're trying to get higher ISP, increasing the chamber pressure is not the most important thing. Um, that the ch Increasing the chamber pressure is mainly something you do to get more thrust out of a certain area. So yes, higher chamber pressures result in higher ISPs, but you can see uh, from a 200 PSI engine, you get 454. From a 2000 PSI engine, you get 460. So it's not really that big a deal. Okay, uh, and uh, nozzle exit conditions. So if you wanted to see different area ratios, let's see from 10 to 200 and step of five. Okay, and we can see the optimum ratios here, uh, exit, um, the exit ratios, and what kind of ISP you get in vacuum for each. It doesn't show the sea level one, unfortunately, but or whether you get flow separation. But I, I don't know if you can add columns. I don't think so. So anyway, uh, you get 424 down here at a ratio of 10. At a ratio of 200, you get 487. Now, this is probably the optimal thing without you know, taking the efficiencies into account. But 487 there, so that's quite a thing. Anyway, so that's about all I think. Oh, yes, uh, throttling. Um, we saw that we had uh, inputted uh, throttle range of 20 to 100%. And here we have the 20% situation and 100% situation. We see at 20%. Um, the sea level uh, ISP is only 177, even though at 100% it's 348. So that's rough. 
uh, and the chamber pressure, uh, th it is because the chamber pressure has gone down so much. The way you throttle the engine, as far as this is concerned, is that you've reduced the chamber pressure. You reduce the amount of fuel going into the chamber, and therefore the chamber pressure is reduced. Um, in vacuum, it doesn't ma matter so much because there isn't ambient pressure pushing in. So when you have less chamber pressure, uh, the vacuum ISP doesn't change that much. And you can see 100% here. But yeah, the sea level ISP gets hurt pretty badly. So that's a thing. Anyway, so that's another feature. So really useful, obviously, if you had to do all these calculations by hand, it'd be a pain. Um, I think uh, if you look at the documentation, this is the user manual, and uh, it explains a lot of this stuff. Ooh, I, di I didn't even know about this design chamber geometry thing. Engine design. Well, see, I think this, this might be in the standard edition, yeah. So if you want to use that, I don't know if you have to get the license for it or not. But yeah, so this is some of the other features <laughs> that I have not used. And that's pretty fancy. Look at that. Anyway, there's stuff that I have to learn about this program too, obviously. But I'll leave it here for now. I think we've covered the basic details. So with that, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did enjoy this video, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.